Just so you know, Pastor Nick is away also. We sent him away because I heard he ended the service with like an hour left. <laughs> Preached for five minutes and then said he was done. So I've sent him to a preaching school. No, I'm just joking. He's just, he's just on holidays. <laughs> hey, this past Wednesday, we, uh, I play softball with a number of guys in the church. And so afterwards, uh, uh, the Tysons and the Gilflins went out with, um, with Ainsley and I for chicken wings over at uh, Johnny Canucks. And so we're sitting with Pastor Adam and, and Rachel, and, and we get talking about, about how uh, everybody's eager to find out about what they're having. Now, some people have found out, and I'm not going to let that out of the bag right now in case you don't know, but, but everybody's always asking what, what do you think you're going to have? What do you want to have? Now, most people, when they get asked that question, what do you want to have, they lie. You, you know, they say, oh, as, as long as it's healthy. Now, if you ask Pastor Adam, he doesn't lie. He says, I want a boy. I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I've, had, I've got enough girls in the house. I just need a boy. But, but, but most people will say to you, I just want a healthy baby. How many of you who have kids said that when you were pregnant? Guys, this is not the time for you to put up your hands, by the way. Yeah. But... But you, you say, hey, I just want a healthy baby. And so the baby's born, and you find out the sex, and, and then you ask the question, is it healthy? And the, the doctor does a little overview and finds out, <coughs> excuse me, finds out what, whether or not the baby's healthy. And that's all you want to hear is that the baby is incredibly healthy. Now, now that, that might be good news, that your child's healthy when they're born. But none of us would want our child just to stay at that spot, just to, to have that one moment where the doctor says that the baby is healthy at that point. Each of us as parents want our child to continue to be healthy, not just be healthy for a moment. And, and so this morning I want to just give you some information that, that may or may not help you, but, but I did a little research this week to find out what it is that that's considered healthy beyond the birth moment. What it is that would consider, consist of, uh, or what, what a child would need in order to be considered healthy beyond the birth moment. So if we open up the, the next slide, you'll find that there are four things that are signs of health. The first is feeding. What, what, the, what the doctors say is that a healthy child, after they're born, they will continue to eat on a regular basis somewhere between one one, once every one to three hours. That's why, that's why new moms are really the heroes in life. They, they, they need more applause than they ever get because one to three hours, the child's crying out for more food. A healthy baby will eat very regularly. Secondly, not only do they need to eat, but they have to get rid of that food or else they're just going to get really big, and so they need to eliminate. And they, the doctors say that when a child's healthy, they will urinate more and then they will dispose less. They, 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 will, they will have bowel movements less, so they urinate more and bowel movements less, and so that's a good sign. Thirdly, they will see some key signs of movement within that child after they've been born. In the first three months, that child should be able to lift their head all by themselves. Then, when they, between the three-month mark and the six-month mark, they should be able to roll and sit by themselves. Then, when they are almost nine months, they should be able to crawl, and by the age of one years old, they should be able to walk by themselves. And lastly, doctors say that not only do they need to be feeding properly, eliminating properly, moving, but there should be growth taking place in their life. And, and this growth is, is that they should, they should be growing half to one inch and five to seven ounces every week from the birth to six months. So, so a, a child, if they're healthy, they're going to be growing. You're, you actually can measure it. If, if they've grown half an inch to one inch in, in the first week, they're, they're healthy. If In the first three weeks, if they've grown one and a half to three inches, then, then they're healthy. You can measure it because there's a, certain, there's a certain growth height. There's a certain weight, five to seven ounces per week that they've been born. And so doctors will look at these things at each of the checkups, make sure they're feeding properly, ask mom, hey, are they eating regularly? Yes, yes, yes. Are, are they eliminating regularly? Yes, yes, yes. Are, are, are they, is there movement there? Yep, that's good. And let's check out their, their growth signs. And we want to make sure that those are in place to make sure they're healthy. Now, now I want to suggest this morning that the same elements that we look at for the physical health of an individual should be some of the things that we look at with regards to our spiritual health. Healthy Christians, spiritually healthy individuals, will be feeding regularly. 
They won't just be going to the Word of God on random basis, showing up at church once a year. They, they will get into the food on a regular basis. That's a healthy Christian. Healthy Christians will eliminate regularly. Now, spiritually, I'm talking about, right? This morning, we, during communion, we took a moment to ask God for forgiveness. We, we, we said, God, would you clean up some of the, the waste that's in my life? Some of us make some decisions in our life. We say, hey, I'm not going to watch that anymore. I'm not going to listen to that anymore. I'm not going to be part of that anymore because that, that's waste. That, that's stuff that Jesus doesn't want in my life, and so we eliminate. Healthy Christians will, will move properly. They're not just people who just lethargically lay around and go, I just believe in Jesus. They're involved, they're serving, they figure out what their gifts are. They're, they're moving. I, I feel that sometimes as Christians, though, we focus so much on the Bible, the, the feeding, so much on the eliminating, the moral, live, the moral stuff, so much on the service, like trying to find a role, ushering, or doing the sound, or being on the worship team, or being part of a small group, but serving, that sometimes we forget to pay attention to the last area, the growth. To be able to actually measure whether or not we're growing. So here's, here's a question I want to ask you. Can you identify where you've grown right now from where you were one year ago? Are you able to measure what has grown in your spiritual life from a year ago? And most of us, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm overextending myself, but many of us probably don't focus on the growth measurement elements. Checking to see whether or not we are growing spiritually. But as a church, we believe in ongoing discipleship. We believe that we don't maintain, but we grow. We, we, we grow. We don't maintain. We don't just stay. The, 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 that declaration of, of the, the doctor over the baby, the baby is born and it's healthy. We, we don't just go, okay, I'm saved now. I'm healthy. That's it. Just get me to heaven. We don't stay at the infantile stage. We want to keep growing. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about one of our core values, at ongoing discipleship. We grow, we don't maintain. So I want you to look in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. And you're going to see it up on the screen. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, we read this. About this, we have much to say that is hard to explain. Since you have become dull in understanding, for though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you, again, the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Now, we don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Many people think Paul... And, and I'm not going to give a whole discourse on that, but we'll just, we'll just call the, the writer of Hebrews the author. And, and so the author of this, this passage that we just read, he, he's sharing about the high priest. If you just look at the preceding verses, he's talking about Jesus being our high priest. And he's trying to give a theological teaching that, that has great significance to, the, to the, these Jewish Christians. And he comes to a place and he says, man, I, I really wish that I could tell you so much more, but, but I've come to realize that some of you have stopped growing. He, he says, you've stopped growing and I want you to grow. I want you to be further ahead. I don't want you to maintain, but I want you to be growing, to pursuing ongoing discipleship. And he, he begins to paint a picture, and we see the, the, the phrases that I underlined in, in the, the text. We see some key elements that show us what a growing Christian should be doing. And so this morning, I want to look at what it takes for this ongoing discipleship to take place. The first thing is, is that I think you need to maximize your effort. Maximize your effort. He says, I'd like to tell you more. I'd like to. I, I, want, to, I want to go so much deeper with you. I, I want to take into the depths of God's riches. But what I've discovered is that your ears have become dull. They become dull. Now, that's what the language that we read in some translations, but the, the actual, the truest definition that it comes from this passage in the original language is that they had become slothful. That, that the people who were, who were the recipients of this letter, that they had become slothful. It's not even dull ears, it's they become slothful. That this word slothful means lazy, inactive, 
having a dispensation to avoid exertion. Anybody ever work with a slothful individual? I'm not going to ask you about the people around you right now, but, but I think we all understand a slothful individual. Somebody who, who will put as least amount of effort into it as possible. I used to be a janitor at City Hall in Oshawa when I was in Bible college. I made, made some really, really good money back then. And, 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 I, and I would notice that there were individuals who put maximum effort into their job. And then there were those who were slothful. Let me, let me, let me describe the slothful individuals. You would say to the slothful individual, hey, I want you to sweep this room right here. We need to sweep it first of all so that we can then bring out the buffer and shine the floors. And the, and the individual would go, okay, no problem. And the boss would go away so that it's just the individual with the broom. And, and, and no one's o- overlooking their shoulder and so they do this. <sighs> My arms are so sore. Oh, yeah, Just take a break. That's that was a lot of effort. The boss would come in and just a little bit more. They 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 would just do as little as possible. If you did an inspection of the room, you would find out after a long period of time of them sweeping, you would find out that there was dirt everywhere, because they put the least amount of effort into it. That was possible. They, they just did the bare minimum. They, they would see the big, the big piles of dirt. You know, there, there'd be all, a pile of dirt right there, right at the entranceway from where people walked in. So they take care of that because they know the boss is going to see that. So just get rid of that stuff and just push it into the corner underneath someone's desk. That, that's, that's what you do. But they would never get around to the corners. They, they wouldn't find some of the other the extreme spots in the, in the room. They were just slothful. But an individual who maximized their efforts would do this. They they would put every bit of effort into they're sweeping. This is what happens when you have illustrative messages. Paul, Paul's saying, hey, you, you Jewish Christians, some of you have become slothful when it comes to your spiritual life. You, I'm tired now. <laughs> he says, look, this is, this is the, here's the deal. When it comes to your spiritual life, you're just doing what the bare basics. You're just dealing with the big stuff. You're just putting in as little as you possibly can, just making sure that you take care of the basics of your spirituality. But you're not giving it the maximum effort. Let me ask you a question. When you approach your spirituality, do you put the most amount of effort into it or just the bare basics? I really do feel winded. Let me, just get, let me just grab a drink of water. Did I tell you about my bike ride late recently? Yeah, I think I did. When it comes to your spiritual life, do you put the best effort in or the bare basics? Does it come to a place when you, when you read your Bible that you're giving everything that you have that you're opening up and going, God, I need you to speak to my life. I want to find out what the Word says to me. I'm not just going to read the words, but I want to meditate on it. I want to dive into it. I'm putting my best effort into it. Or you, one of these individuals, goes, that looks good. And you scan over the pages. Okay, I'm done. Because it's a task. Did you read your Bible? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done that before. I, I, I pull out my, my reading plan. I'm doing the one-year Bible. Pull out my reading plan. Get to something like Leviticus or Numbers. Numbers is boring. I'm sorry. But it, it's, and I start to read and just scan right through it. And, and Did you read? Oh, yeah. 
just littlest effort, just my eyes have seen every word. Paul's saying, hey, I want you to maximize your effort. I want you to dig into it. What about prayer? Is, is prayer just something that you turn to God when, when, it comes to your pr- when it comes to crisis in your life and you just offer a prayer there or you pray over your grace or you just say a quick word before you go into a situation or are you going after God with your whole heart? Are you pursuing him like he's, he's all that you've got? I mean, maximum effort to pursue him. Or are you just making sure that you spend a few moments each day so you don't feel guilty about your Christianity, maximizing your effort? What, what about when it comes to serving? Do you just wait for someone to ask you to serve, or are you looking for spots to serve? Are you constantly seeking out the leadership, constantly seeking out people who are in charge of certain areas, saying, hey, how can I get involved? Or are you just going, hey, I did my one thing this year, and I'm fine? Maximize your effort. Those who are watching online, I'm so thankful for our online viewing capabilities. But, but I want to su- suggest that, that there are people in our world who don't maximize their attendance at church. They, they show up just every now and then, but they don't put a whole lot of effort into it. You see, friends, every area of our life where we're going to see growth needs the maximum level of effort. You want your marriage to be successful? Then put the most amount of effort into it. You want your job to be successful? Then put the maximum amount of effort into it. You want your yard to look beautiful? Then put the maximum level of effort into it. You want your relationship with God to grow? Then put the maximum effort into it. Don't don't just do the bare basics. Don't just cross off, yep, did my devotions today. Yep, went to church today. Yep, showed up at Easter today. No, he's saying, I want you to maximize to maximize your effort. I remember, I remember there was this, this youth ministry when I, when I was youth director, I had heard about. The youth ministry had grown to a, to a large amount of kids. It was around 90 students and, and, and in, a, in a church that wasn't a large church. It, things were going really, really good. They had hit their historic moment. And then they went through some transitions. And then this new youth pastor came in and he decided to move the youth night to a night that was inconvenient for the kids, but convenient for him. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. Students don't appreciate that night. Why would he do that? Because he just needed to make sure that there was youth happening. Then I I found out that he canceled the junior high program and he amalgamated the junior highs and the senior highs together. Put them on the same night. So now they don't have their own two nights. Why? Because it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort to run two different nights of ministry. Then I start to hear that he was showing up less to church. That, 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 that he was maximizing an area of pleasure in his life. Not a sinful pleasure, but an, an, an area of pleasure. And he was spending many of his office hours outside the office engaged in this activity. Then I heard that he was actually putting together youth events that he wouldn't even show up to. And this youth ministry that had been 90 students had dwindled down to just a handful of kids. And so finally, the youth pastor said, I'm leaving. And when they made the public announcement about this youth pastor leaving, the pastor of the church made a comment saying, the reason why this youth pastor has to leave is because our youth ministry is not going very strong because you parents in the church are not supporting his ministry and pointed the blame at the people. And I got to tell you, I was angry inside. I thought to myself, it's not the parent's problem. The problem has to do with his effort, the youth pastor's effort. If he put more effort into it, if he made more sacrifices, if he gave his best, if he gave his all, he'd actually be able to see growth in this youth ministry. And friends, I want to tell you that if you will put your best effort at your spiritual life, you're going to see growth. But my suggestion to you today is this. We are where we are spiritually based upon the effort we're putting into it. You you, you are where you are spiritually because of the amount of effort you're putting into it. If you're in a place where, where it's just blah, most likely it's because you've put blah effort into it. I've never seen a person who's given 110% in their spiritual life live in the blah. Oh, they'll have difficult moments. Oh, they'll have plateaus. 
but they will always come out with a fervor and a passion and a zeal, and they'll hear God, and they'll see God moving because they put every effort into it. And the author of Hebrews says, I want to give you more. I want to take you further. I want to grow you, but you, your effort has become slothful. Let me ask you, church, has your effort for your, spiritual, your own spiritual growth become slothful? Or are you giving it everything you've got? Are you praying like, with, like, like, like all heaven depends, or your whole life depends on heaven? Are you reading the scriptures like it's the first time you've ever read it? Are you taking time to praise God? Are you, are you asking him to speak to you? Are you listening to his voice? Are you giving it your best? Or are you just kind of like doing a little bit and just standing back? The growing Christian will maximize their effort. Number two, not only will you maximize your effort, you will maximize your vision. The author says this, you ought to be teachers at this point. You ought to be teachers. But instead, you're just students. And, and if, you, if you start to study this passage, you'll see that the, 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 the language the author is using, he's suggesting that they're at a place where they're only able to understand the ABCs of faith. He says, you ought to be teachers, but you're only a student now. I mean, you've been, you've been in Christianity forever. You should be teaching. You should be a PhD in faith. But you're just a grade one student who's just barely able to grasp the ABCs. You see, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. The question is, how have you been growing in that time? How have you been growing in that time? And, and the author says, you ought, you ought. Now, this word ought is really interesting. It means to owe someone to be indebted under obligation through accruing. That last part's important, under obligation through accruing. What, what, what the author is saying is that, that because of all that we've accrued in our faith, because of every sermon that we've heard, because of every Bible study that we've been part of, because of every book that we've read, because of every conversation we've had with another person of faith, we've accrued a certain amount, and we're now under the obligation to give it away. To give it away. And the author says you need to maximize your vision because your vision right now is simply towards you and yet what God wants for your life is a vision that's towards other people. It's towards others. I remember when I began to hear the voice of the Spirit for myself. I, I, I was a teenager and I was listening to his voice on a regular basis. I, I just practiced on myself. I, I'd just be down in the basement with my lights, the lights off so I wouldn't be distracted and, and I'd you know, I talk to God about everything. I, I talk to him about the things that teenagers talk to God about. God, someday I want to be married, so could you give me a fine-looking girl who loves you? That would usually start my message, or my, my, my prayer. God, what's the deal with the girl? Where is she? Tell you what I think she should look like. And you know, I just lay it out. And I'd pray through all the things. God, help me at school. Help me with this. Help me with this. Help me with this. And lay it all out. And then I get to the end. It's like, God, what do you want to say? I just listen, and, and, I, and, what, and I just listen to his voice, and I just start speaking out the things I thought he was saying to me. And that might seem weird, but I was trying to learn how to hear his voice. Then I got into the early parts of ministry in Bible college, and I start speaking, and, and I start thinking, what if I listen to God's voice for other people? And, and, and I had a couple of good moments, but then as I became a youth pastor, I told, told a story a few weeks ago about the, the speaker from the States would come in who talked to us about hearing God's voice, and so I started practicing it. I started I start listening and paying attention to the pictures God, God would put in my, my mind. And so when I'd go and speak at retreats or in a church or wherever I was speaking, I'd, I, I would get, give the altar call, and I'd, and I'd come over to a student, and I'd say, hey, and I'd listen, and I'd say, hey, this is what I think God's saying, and the student would start to cry and download everything that the Holy Spirit said to me. Go over to a leader, and I'd start to share what the Holy Spirit had said to me, and they, they'd start to be moved and, the, and just blown away. i said, say, does that make sense? Oh, that makes tons of sense. It was awesome. Kept on doing it. And I start to notice something as I'm, as I'm ministering in this supernatural way, listening to the voice of the Spirit, sharing things I could never know. People start to come up to me and say, man, you are incredible. I wish I could hear from the Holy Spirit like that. I'd hear it all the time. I wish I could hear from the Holy Spirit like that. I wish I could hear from the Holy Spirit like that. And, and there is, I'm, I'm being honest, there is this temptation in my life just to hold it all in. Just to be a fat, super Christian. Look at me. 
I am a supernatural, big-eared, both physically and spiritually, a big-eared individual who can hear from the Holy Spirit. Look at me. Pull up my shirt. There's a big ass there for super Christian. I, I wanted, I, I, there was a temptation in my life just to hoard it all to myself so people would go, well, wow, there's Jeff. There's the guy who knows how to hear from God. There is a temptation that we, we gain all the knowledge so that people look at us and go, that person knows the word. That person's a person who knows how to pray. That's a person who knows how to serve. The Holy Spirit started to speak to me, though, about the things I was hearing. And he said, you, you, need, to, you need to teach them. You, you need to have a vision beyond yourself. You should be a teacher by now. You should be a te- You've gained so much, it's time to give it away. You need to maximize your vision. God, what does that look like? He says, I want you, wherever you go, I want you to teach people how to hear the voice of the Spirit. But then they're going to hear from you just like I do. I know. And that's what the kingdom's about. And so I start showing up in, in youth retreats and in conferences and churches, and I would teach people how to hear from the Holy Spirit. And we, we'd get to the end of the service and said, okay, now that's what we're going to do, partner up. And we'd partner up all over the, the place where we're meeting. And I said, you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. You're going to try this out today. And I would then let them do this, and we'd pray. And I'd say, okay, now let's share. And person after person would begin to share about how the Holy Spirit was speaking to them and how they had shared over their partner, shared over this person, and how it became something that was legitimate that God had actually spoken to them about. I moved into this teaching realm, this this bigger vision that was beyond me for other people. And the author of Hebrews is saying that a growing Christian shouldn't be an individual who's just simply trying to get, 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 get. We don't need fat Christians, friends. If your goal in spirituality is just to get into the next sermon, just to be part of the next small group, just to be part of the next Bible study, you're missing what Christianity is all about and you've likely stopped growing. Because by this point, you should be teachers. By this point, you should be passing it along. By this point, you should be maximizing your vision beyond me to other people. Giving it away. It it sure got quiet in here. Friends, I just I, I want to be honest because I want this to be a church that's growing and alive. Some of you have been in church long enough that you don't need another Bible study. You don't need another sermon. You don't need another video series. You need to grow your vision. You need to get to a place where you've got something to give away. Where, where everything that's inside of you, you take what you need and then you give the rest to everybody else. But if all we do is just come to church, just feed me again, Pastor. Just feed me again. Just feed me again. Just feed me again. I just need another Bible study. I just need, I'm not, I'm, I know I'm being really silly and maybe offensive. I don't mean to be. But I've been in so many churches where everybody's just living for the next meal. Their vision is only towards themselves. And the author says if you're growing, you will maximize your vision. You will go beyond self and give away to other people. That's a growing Christian. I remember, I remember when we had Bailey. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't babysit babies. I mean, I think we looked after our niece a little bit, but Ainsley was with me, so that was everything was good. She knew what she was doing, but I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Now there's this kid in my life that I'm responsible for. I mean, I mean Ainsley's going to feed him for the first little while, but then three, six months later, he's on Pablum, and I, I got to help out. Then we got to figure out We've got to figure out which gerbers he likes. The most gross thing ever created in humanity. I mean, corn and, and spinach and brown sugar. Like, I mean, gross. I, anyways, I've got to figure out which food to use. And, and I've got to figure out how to teach him how to use the toilet properly because diapers are expensive. If you've ever trained a child in, in, in that area... It is the place where you lose your Christianity. Washing machines constantly going. Your anger is con- constantly high. And you, you are constantly trying to... Ha- Come on, baby. How hard is it that when your bladder starts to feel like it needs to release, that you simply step into the bathroom, pull down your pants, sit down or stand up, whatever you got to do, and just let it go? How hard is this? But it was very complicated for him. 
I kept stepping, but I had learned how. <laughs> I know, I know, this is not the thing you came to church for. Pastor Jeff taught us how he learned how to go to the washroom. But I learned some things in life that now my kid needed. And as I learned how to communicate, I learned how to teach him, I learned how to help him get to that place, I grew too because, it, because I learned how to be patient. I learned how to communicate. I learned how I, that things needed to take time. I learned how to try to encourage. I, lear- I grew. And friends, when you maximize your vision beyond yourself to other people, and you start to step into people's lives to help them grow with the stuff that you have, you will grow yourself. I'm just going to say this one last time. I'll move off the point. If your Christianity is only about you, you've stopped growing. You've stopped growing. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how much you tithe. I don't care care how holy you are or how much you pray. If your Christianity has stopped at you, your vision is much too small, and you need to listen to the author of Hebrews who says, by this time, you are obligated because of all you've accrued in your head and in your heart and in your experience, and you need to give it away. That's a growing Christian. They maximize their vision. And so they maximize their efforts they maximize their vision, and lastly, they maximize their training. The author says, you should have had, no, sorry, he says, solid food is for the mature. Solid food. He, he gives this whole illustration between milk and solid food. Can, can you imagine if we, after church, I said, hey, we're all going out for dinner. It's going to be on the church. First of all, we'd kill the budget. But, but just say that we had, that we had the budget, and we were going to take everybody out. And every single person in this place orders Enfilac. I mean, we're sitting, we're sitting at Montana's, and everybody else is eating ribs and steak and potatoes and, and all kinds of chicken and all kinds of stuff, and every one of the people from CPC pulls out a ball and is drinking Enfilac. People would go, that's why we don't go to a Pentecostal church, because we were never meant to live on the milk. We were meant to move on to the solid food, and the author says, hey, the, the You should be eating solid food, which is for the mature. And this word mature is so interesting because it means to work out or train with full emotion, to go through the necessary stages, and then lastly it means exposed to graduated resistance. Let me me explain what it means to be mature. This, this, This idea of training. When I first started working out a number of years ago, there wasn't any muscle tone on my body. I mean, I had just kind of let it go. I was one shape, just one shape everywhere, all amalgamated. And so I started to go to the gym, and, and I, I, I didn't know what I was doing, and so I would just lift weights, just pick up, pick up dumbbells that I felt comfortable with, you know, 20 pounds, and I'd just go like this. And, I, and I, I'd, I'd do them for 10, you know, 10 reps, put it down. Let's try that again. I saw somebody the other day at the gym doing this. This, this girl who's talking to her boyfriend, she's just like this. <laughs> I thought, girl, you have no idea. <laughs> You're only here for the guy anyways. Anyways, so, so just, just doing this, right? Just doing this. And I just kept doing that. And then I'd go over to, to, to the barbell and uh, try 15. Put it down, pick it up again. And I, and I would do that in my whole routine. I, just, I kept doing the same type of thing. I've been doing it for a few weeks, and I'm starting to get frustrated because I'm putting a lot of effort into this. Like, I got the first one down. I got, I'm putting tons of effort into this. But my muscles are not growing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I need to go buy protein shakes. I, I don't know what the deal is. And I start to look around the gym. I start to pay attention. start to ask my friend Dave, who's a trainer, about, about what I can do to maximize my training. And what I learned is that when you work out, you start off with what's comfortable, and you, you, do, a, you do a set of what's comfortable. So, so tw- 20, 20 pounds with the barbell. And then you put it down, and you increase the resistance. You're going to try 25 now. Then you move up to 30, then 35, and then 40. And you, by the time, the difference between 20 and 40 is incredible. 20 is like this. I mean, you start spinning it around your finger. It's easy. No, you don't do that, but but 40. (laughs) 
because the resistance is so strong. <clears throat> and you, do, you can't do the 10, you might do six. And I thought, this is crazy. I am sore. I learned something, that when I start to feel discomfort, then I know that the training is causing growth. When, when I'm feeling discomfort, then the training is going to create growth. You see, I would, I would do the 20 to 40, and then I get to a place where I, after doing that for a few weeks, I get comfortable with the 40. And so then I, I'd start at a higher level, 25, and I'd push myself up to 45. And do that for a few weeks, and i get comfortable with 45. So then I'd start at 30 and push myself up to 50. And I kept on pushing, kept on stretching, and I knew that I was stretching because when I stretched myself, I would feel discomfort in my arms. That's maximizing your training. But friends, let me tell you this. Many of us have not got much further in our spiritual life because we've not allowed ourselves to face spiritual discomfort. We, we read scriptures what we're comfortable with. We serve at a level we're comfortable with. We pray with a level that we're comfortable with. We give with a level that we're comfortable with. We, we listen to the Holy Spirit only to a level that we're comfortable with. And we wonder why our muscles aren't growing. And the author says that the mature are those who train, maximize their training by constantly stretching themselves. I don't know how long you pray for, but I remember the first time I was going to try to pray for 30 minutes. I mean, this was a big deal in my life as a teenager, praying for 30 minutes. As so I went downstairs in my basement, and I began to call out on God. I, I, gave, I mean, my passion was exuding from my life. He gave it everything I had, prayed for, for everything I could think of, praised a little bit, just everything I got. And I was like, man, this has to be 30 minutes. And then I turned on the lights and looked at my watch, and I had done five. I, man, that was a stretch for me, those five. But I was determined for 30 Kept on praying, kept on thinking up new things, tried to pray for every nation of the world that I knew of, thought about every person that I'd ever come in contact with in my life, be with Mrs. Brock, my grade one teacher, be, be, be with this person that I, I met at the grocery store three years ago. I mean, just, I pray for everything, just to get to the 30 minute mark. And finally, at the end of my prayer time, I looked at it and I had died at 30 minutes. Hallelujah! I had met my goal. And I kept on working at that goal of 30 minutes got to a place where 30 minutes was pretty easy to do. And so I thought, I'm going to try to go for 45. I hit the 30-minute mark, no problem. But then when I wanted to get to the 35-minute mark, oh, man, that was difficult. I had to start learning new countries. I had to start meeting new people. I had to start asking people for their, what's going on in their life so that I could figure out what else to pray for. I had to pray once again for that girl to be in my life. I kept on pushing myself. And it was a dis, dis, there was a moment of discomfort. And I finally got to a place of the 45. And then I could get beyond that. But I kept growing in my prayer time because I kept pushing myself beyond what I was comfortable with. You see, the author says that the solid food is for those who have trained themselves, who've maximized their resistance, who continue to allow themselves to be stretched. So let me ask you, as a Christian... When was the last time you stretched yourself? When was the last time you pushed beyond what you normally pray? When was the last time you read beyond what you normally read? When was the last time that you served beyond what you normally served? When was the last time you gave beyond what you normally gave? When was the last time you waited in silence beyond what you normally wait? When was the last time that you put yourself into a risky situation and listened to the voice of the Spirit longer than what you normally would before just moving into prayer? When was the last time you stretched yourself? You say, well, pastor, that's great. That's a great, great idea in that. But come on, is this really biblical? Jesus did it all the time. That's how he grew his disciples. I mean, I want you just to think about it. He turns to Peter, who is so good at fishing from the boat. He says, you're good at that, but let me bring you into a place of discomfort to maximize your training. Get out of the boat and start to walk on water. Now, I know he asked for it, but Jesus wasn't going to allow him to do anything that he didn't think was a good idea. Go ahead, Peter. It's time to stretch you as a Christian. It's time to stretch you as a disciple. Let's try walking on water. I don't know how. This is uncomfortable. I know. And he starts to sink because it's a place of discomfort. He, he, he turns to the disciples and says, hey, you guys are really good at feeding 12 people. You're really good at feeding this group here. 
It's time, though, that you feed 5,000. <gasps> what? We know how to do the 12. Yeah, but I want to grow you. I want to stretch you. I want to move you into a different place. I don't want you to maintain. And they now feed 5,000. He, he, he says to the disciples, hey, I want you to, to go and pray for people. And, and they go over to this, this man with a, a boy who, who's demon-possessed, and, the, and, and they say all the things and that, and they can't do it. So Jesus comes back, and they, like, Jesus, wh- wh- why can't we do it? Well, this doesn't come just by nice words. It comes through prayer and fasting. We can pray, no, but you also have to fast. I want you to restrain yourself from food so that you can see supernatural breakthroughs. He did that. He, he turns to the disciples, they're in the garden, and he, and he says, hey, pray with me. And so they start to pray together, and the disciples are so comfortable with the five-minute prayer, ten-minute prayer, but Jesus is a radical. He prays for an hour. I, I mean, the first time at least. An hour. The hour prayer. And they can't handle it. Jesus is like, could you not pray for just one hour? I'm trying to stretch your faith. Turns to the disciples and says, hey, you believe in miracles. You hear about miracles. You, you see miracles. Now it's time for you to go and do miracles. Oh, hold on. We're just the Sunday morning type of disciples. We just want to sit and hear about them, Pastor. We just, want to, we just want to see you operate like that. We just want to tell stories about what you did. You actually want us to go? Yeah, because I'm trying to grow you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, that's what Jesus did with his disciples, friends. And I'm looking for a church of people who don't maintain. I'm looking for a church who have ongoing discipleship. That whether we've been saved for one week or we've been saved for 50 years, that we're constantly coming to Jesus saying, stretch me, Jesus. Grow me, Jesus. Maximize my training, Jesus. Push me into areas that I'm uncomfortable with because these muscles can't atrophy. They've got to keep growing so that I'm a healthy individual for Christ. Maximize my efforts. Maximize my training and maximize my vision. Pastor Steve, would you come back? There was, a, there was a man who had been working at a job for 25 years. He had done the same job over and over and over and over again for 25 years. He had never got a raise. He had never been promoted. And, and, and for years he had been fine with this, but finally he's at this place and he's like, man, I'm just so upset. My boss hasn't been treating me right. So he got the boldness, made an appointment with his boss, walked into his boss's office very boldly. He said, boss, I want to tell you something. He said, I've been here for 25 years. I've never got a raise, and I've been doing the same job. He says, I think that you've neglected me. He says, after all, I have a quarter century of experience. His boss looked at him and said, sir, you don't have a quarter century of experience. You have one experience you've been doing for a quarter century. I share that story to say that there may be some people in here who have one spiritual level that you've had for a quarter of a century or you've had for 10 years or you've had for five years and you think, man, look how great I am and Jesus is looking at you saying it's time to move beyond that experience and grow your faith. Grow yourself. Stretch yourself. Because the more we stretch, the more we grow, the more this place grows. The more God's kingdom grows. We are a church that believes in ongoing discipleship. We grow. We don't maintain. Would you stand with me? Pastor Steve, just begin to softly play. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. And those of you who are Christians, I want you just to begin to reflect on what I've just shared. God's calling you to maximize your efforts. If you could be honest with yourself, how are you doing in this area? Are you slothful? Have you done just the bare basics or are you giving everything? Does the Father look down upon you and say, man, there's somebody pursuing me with their whole heart. Are you maximizing your efforts? Have you maximized your vision? Have you seen a vision... The, the vision that Jesus sees for you. That you wouldn't just grow as an individual, but you would help the people around you grow. By now, you ought to be teachers. And lastly, are you maximizing your training? Are you doing what's just comfortable, or are you allowing your muscles to grow because of discomfort? Stretching, stretching. I want you to reflect on that just for a few moments. There are those in this place that maybe you've come in and you don't know Jesus. 
And I'm here to tell you that what Jesus did on the cross for you is so overwhelming. He did it for each person here. That we were separated from the Father. Our sins kept us at distance from God. And we could never do anything to get that distance close. And so Jesus came, died on the cross, took our place. And he says that if you would believe that he died for you, confess him with your mouth and ask him to cleanse you of your sins, he will completely clean the slate and bring you into relationship with him. If you're in this place, you've never given your life to Jesus, would you just raise your hand and say, I'd like to do it right now? I'd like to do it right now. Is there anybody in this place? Just quickly raise your hand. So many in this place have done this before. Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to start following him. I want to be in relationship with him. Just raise your hand really, really quickly. Anybody in this place? Thank you. Thanks so much over there to my right. Anybody else? Come on, join this young lady. Anybody else? Give you one more chance. I'm going to invite our altar team just to come forward right now. Just slip out. If you could come really quick. And I'm going to invite that, this young lady. No one's looking around. But if you would just wouldn't mind coming over here and just meeting Ruthine right here. She's right here to my right. She's going to walk you through the prayer and she'll lead you to the back to grab one of the bags. Thanks, Ruthine. And if you need prayer at any point this morning, you, you have a physical need, a spiritual need, an emotional need, financial need, whatever it is, our, our altar team is here, our prayer team is here just to pray with you, and you can slip out of your pew to be prayed for in just a moment. But as we close this service, I'm looking for a church that's growing. I'm not just talking about the numbers. I'm so thankful for what God's doing here. I'm thankful for, for, for how this church keeps growing numerically. I'm surprised even this summer we've been growing numerically, but that's not the greatest thing to celebrate. I love seeing the growth in people's lives. And I'm asking you where you're at, not just what you're feeding, not what you're eliminating, not where you're moving, but how's the growth being measured, your effort, your vision, your training. And as I close in just a moment, this is my prayer for you. That this week you get alone with God and say, God, it's time for me to grow beyond where I was at last week. It's time for me to grow beyond where I was at last year. I want, I want Pastor Jeff to be able to ask me, what, where have you grown this past year? I want to be able to declare to him, I know exactly where I've grown. I know how I've grown. That each of us would find something in our lives that God needs to grow. And so Jesus, as we close the service, I thank you so much for what you've done. But the author of Hebrews reminds us that we could know so much, we could experience so much more, but we need to keep growing. And I pray that this church would be a church that maximizes its efforts, God. That we won't just give a little bit, but we will give everything we've got. I pray that we will pray with all our heart. I pray we will study your word. I pray that we will serve and share our faith. I pray that we'll give like we've never given before. I pray we listen like we've never listened before. Let us maximize our efforts, God. I pray that we will maximize our vision, that our vision would be beyond ourselves and be to the people around us. Let us constantly figure out how we can help people grow in their faith. And God, I pray that you would maximize, you would maximize our training this week. Allow us to do something that stretches us. Allow us to do something that's beyond what we've done before. Allow us to grow so that we can experience the discomfort that produces health in our lives. We commit this to you now. Jesus, use this congregation to impact Ottawa. May we share the greatest story ever, every opportunity we can. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.